And it's just a huge honor for me to be podcast interviewing Mo. You might know her as Monica Anderson from DrMoAnderson.com. Dr. Mo Anderson is an author, dentist, and dynamic motivational speaker. She is a graduate of the University of Minnesota School of Dentistry and Baylor University. She has published six books, including a best-selling romance novel, a book on Ebonics, and her most recent release, Success is a Side Effect, Leadership, Relationships, and Selective Amnesia. She believes each person must have a customized definition of success and a personal board of directors to achieve their highest potential. In her lectures, podcasts, and writings, Dr. Mo frequently accounts, recounts the numerous challenges she has overcome and the lessons learned with courage and grace. Her story has been called a master class in corporate ascension, taking audiences from her greatest accomplishments to the lows of being diagnosed with a rare malignant form of cancer in 2012, then again in 2013. This native Texan has a very diverse background, which includes owning a private dental practice, owning a GNC franchise, hosting a Time Warner cable television program, and eight years writing a weekly lifestyle column for the Fort Worth Star Telegram. Today, she works as a consultant for a dental insurance corporation, speaks to groups around the country, and spends as much time with her grandchildren as possible. Mo, I just love your energy. I love your karma. I just love everything about you. How are you doing today? I am doing great, and the same back at you. Uh, I finally got to hear you speak at a conference a couple of months ago, and we met, and I mean, I knew of you, but to meet you in person and to see that you're genuine and authentic and uh, really interested in people, you know, it, it was just an instant connection, and it's my pleasure to be here today, Howard. Thank you. Well, I look much better on iTunes. You don't want to, <laughs> you don't want to see me on YouTube, and you certainly don't want to see me live, so I'm sorry you had to witness that firsthand. So, Mo, when I look at the, the stats on Podcaster, it, it, it's a 30 and under behavior. I mean, it's mostly generation nexters and millennials. There's right, hardly right. anyone our age on it. Um, so basically two months ago, 6,000 American children just walked out of dental school. And uh, right. what, how, how do they get from, I just walked out of dental school, I'm $350,000 in debt, to where all the where, where Mo is today. So what, what advice would you give these young kids? Because that's primarily who we're talking to. Yeah, you bet. Uh, and as you know, it's all about the journey. And in my latest uh, book that you mentioned, where I talk about success as a side effect, the number one thing I would tell them is to pursue your passions, uh, family, the area of dentistry, whether it's general dentistry or a specialty that you're particularly uh, attracted to, because we've all got things we love to do. You know, number 15 root canals, that's not, that's not my place to be. But you figure out what it is that you love and you pursue that passionately and you don't pursue success. You don't pursue a title or the biggest practice in town or the, you know, the team. You know how some of our colleagues uh, go to conferences and they got their team all dressed in the same colors and they're all saying, my doctor, if that's what you want, then pursue that passionately. But if you want to be the small town doc or the rural doc or to work in some of the underserved areas, do that, do that to the best of your ability and the success that you define will come as a result of your efforts. So that's the number one thing I would tell them. And then the other is keep yourself surrounded. When I talk about personal board of directors, keep yourself surrounded with young people, older people, people your age, people who are not afraid to disagree with you and they will push you to grow. I mean, my, my kids, I, I told you I got a 27 and a 29 year old. They keep me up to date on uh, you know the latest thing that I need to be on, whether it's Instagram or Snapchat, or I don't have time to look at all of that. But you know, they tell me it's almost, I should use them for investing advice instead of just telling me the latest IT. But people like that will help keep you up on what's going on outside of you pursuing your personal mission so that you don't have to spread yourself too thin. Um, and I mean, there are a lot of other things, but family first, it, you've got Ryan working with you, you've got family members working with you, you know how important that is. If you let that go, whether it's mom and dad, sisters and brothers, or your spouse, if you put them aside chasing that, you know, those golden shackles, uh, it's going to come back and not in a good way. You know, that's great advice because so many of them ask, like, <clears throat> if they should uh, get a job or go to specialty school, and, and, and they're asking, like, well, would I make more money in specialty? But what you're yes. saying is, you, don't, you go, go do what you have a passion for. I mean, don't go into endo if you hate endo just because you think right. you'll make more money. Go, go do what you like. 
And they, and they also do that when they get a job. There'll be two offices, but one will pay a higher percent and it's dysfunctional with turnover and it's crazy. And then they'll turn down the happy, functional, smaller office. With yes. With, with less cubicles and a smaller staff because it doesn't, you know, look good in, in photos. But it's how you feel inside at the end of the day. That's 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 what you learn when you've reached, you know, your 50s like me uh, that I didn't understand when I was in my 20s that it's not what's on the outside. It's about you being at peace and you being comfortable with what you're doing and you not being pushed into you know, wherever you are, if you're working with someone else or under someone else, sometimes they can push you into doing things for production or for other reasons that either you're not comfortable doing or you just don't feel are ethical. And you find yourself, even though you've got, you know, all the accessories to life that you wanted that look good, the car and the clothes and the title and the house, that you're a miserable person. And I know a lot of unhappy uh, millionaires and it's, it's not a good place to be. So you're right. So what, what do you mean when you talk about that there's an epidemic of spiritual anorexia? Because well, a fat boy it, like me, it doesn't have much experience <laughs> with anorexia. You know, you know Howard, <laughs> uh, because of my health challenges, I lost uh, about 40 pounds in two months. So I tell you what, I take being a fat boy anytime over that. Uh, <laughs> In fact, I got on my surgeon and told him I did not give him permission to surgically remove my behind. So, <laughs> are you doing okay? Are you are you okay? You know what? I am doing great. I am doing great. I've got a great team, great oncologist. Uh, my t nutrition is on track. Uh, I had um, you know a diagnosis of, of cancer and then a recurrence within two years, but the second time they got it all, and I take a pill every day, uh, and I'm doing. I'm doing great. Uh, targeted immunotherapy, so I'm not doing the, the big chemo and the radiation. Well, we both uh, graduated from the, the dental school the same year, and you look like you could be my daughter, so <laughs> whatever whatever you're doing, it's doing real well. Thank you. Uh, spiritual anorexia, to answer your question, it's not a term people uh, a lot of people are familiar with. I didn't coin it, but it's a term I love because we, we're familiar with physical anorexia. And even, you know, in practice, we're looking for bulimia and people with other um, disorders. But spiritual anorexia is where you look great on the outside, a thick boy or a thick girl, thick with it. I don't have a problem with that. But inside, you're dying because you're unhappy. You're not pursuing your passions. You don't have multiple streams of happiness. So many people look for one thing, whether it be the job or that nonprofit endeavor. They don't realize that there should be a number of things that are contributing to your fulfillment and your personal growth so that if you lose that job, if they downsize, if they cut back, that's not the end of it for you. You're not devastated. Or if the relationship breaks up, you need to have a number of things. While, while you have your passion, your profession, which you're lucky if they're the same thing, you also need other things that are fueling your spirit so that if one dries up, you know, you've still got resources coming in because we just like we give out and we're healthcare providers. We that's what we do. We're nurturers, we're carers, but we also need to be fed. You can't keep doing that. You can't keep giving and not receive. I I mean, I've never heard of that. I've, I've heard of multiple streams of income, but multiple streams of happiness is so amazing. And it reminded me of my mother when my father passed away. Um, you know, she had her Wichita Women's Club, her five girlfriends that always did their bowling yes. and their movies. She's big into her, her church. And, and, yes. and what, I, what I realized that takeaway from that, it was that dad was just one part of my mom's life. And she had multiple other streams of happiness, and she did very well. She did, and, and without even thinking about it. Some people just do it naturally, but others need a little reminder, just like I need to about my cardio program. Now that I've lost weight, you know, I, my only motivation <laughs> was to look great, but I need to exercise. So so we need, we need this. I'm not telling people it's not rocket science, you know. It's not stuff they don't know, but we just need little reminders sometimes because we've got so much going on. Well, my cardiologist told me to spend an hour on the treadmill every day, so now that's just where I take my naps. <laughs> I just put well, a pillow I, and a blanket on that thing, and uh, it works well. I, I renamed my bathroom gym, so now I tell my <laughs> friends I get up and go to the gym every morning. So, you know, we, we, we do what we got to do. So, um, so you, you also talk about the medical benefits of humor. 
Mm -hmm. And you're you're uh, you're very contagious in your enthusiasm. And every time I've uh, hear you, how, how do, I mean, I don't think of dentists as usually funny people. I mean, I I've always said there's a a very negative uh, natural selection for dentists, physicians, and lawyers <laughs> because if you go to college and you're well rounded and you join a frat and you go bowling and you do all these multiple things and make A's, B's and C's, you'll never get into a medical school, dental school, law school in your life. Oh. But if you're a complete geek and you sit in a library every night, I mean, I and got in a year in the library. <laughs> I know I got in, I got into dental school a year early. That's how, how big of a loser I was. I mean, I mean, and, and the four guys that I hung out with um, were the only four guys on our floor of 88 that got into dental school because the rest were well-rounded and had humor and this, and we were just sitting there crushing physics and calculus. And so, so you're talking to a bunch of people who probably aren't well-rounded. I mean, what, what, I mean, what, if someone said, came up to you, Mo, and said, Mo, describe a dentist. What's an average dentist? I mean, what would you say? You know what? That is a great question, <laughs> one I've never been asked before. And before I answer that, let me just say that I, I've been blessed to have a, a pretty balanced right brain and left brain, and I have never, ever had anyone. I've been a dentist 28 years. I've never had anyone guess my profession. I don't even like to talk about what I do, but when people ask, they never guess that. Uh, it's clergy, it's teacher, it's attorney, it's never dentist. So you're right, people have a definite perception of what we're like, but I would say the one thing I see about all of us is that we tend to be a little anal on the OCD side, but that's in a good way because I, I don't want to be in the chair getting a crown prep and the, and the tray and the instruments are all over the place and, you know, the assistant can't find things. I, I need a dentist that's very, very organized. So I don't look at that as being a bad thing, even though that's how people perceive it. Sometimes we take it home and it gets on our, on our spouses and, and partners' uh, nerves a little bit, but it's just the way we're wired. Uh, but you know what, Howard, you, you might need to, to branch out a little bit because, uh, yes, I was very intense at Baylor undergrad uh, because you know how competitive it is to get into dental school. But uh, I've got dental friends that drive race cars, uh, you know, they're out on their boats and, and a river runs through it with the fly fishing. And uh, are they funny? Uh, for the most part, no. But they're still interesting. <laughs> they're still interesting people. And I, I would describe Dennis as, as mostly caring people. Uh, I would say that they are very caring. They tend to be uh, highly intelligent, of course, and have a lot of interest like you. I, I, think, I think we're finding our way. It's just we go through that little period where it's all about reaching a goal and we might not be as broad as, as some of our counterparts. So Mo, uh, you graduated University of Minnesota in 88. I'm just curious, how, how big was your class and how many girls were in it in 88? And how many girl, what percent would that be female today? How, how many girls were in your class in 88? You know what, I'm gonna say, uh, we were probably about 30% females, which you were just starting to see things turn, the tide turn. I know there are more females now than males graduating. Um, and at the University of Minnesota, I can also tell you that I was the only African American in the entire school uh, in the four years, in the four grade levels that they had. Uh, but it was cool. I, I was class president and, and student body president. So it, it was a little different than some of my experiences had been in the South growing up in the 60s. And the, the interesting thing people would say when they described me, it wasn't that I was the African-American student, it was that I was Baptist. They'd say, you know that Baptist girl because all my classmates were Catholic. And so that was just out of this world for me. But now, uh, as you know, most of the graduating class is, is female and things are really changing, but I still have people who are surprised when I tell them that I'm a dentist. They're just expecting, you know, dental assistant or dental hygienist, which are noble and wonderful professions, uh, but that that perception among the general public hasn't quite turned the corner yet, I would say. So my, my two older sisters both went straight into the uh, monastery, the Catholic nunnery at graduation. And my oldest, I've, I've been a dentist 29 years. My older sister, I think she's just past 35, but is, is there Baptist and Southern Baptist or is, is that is that two different things, Baptist and Southern Baptist, or is that the same thing? Um, Technically, they're two different things. Uh, I think a lot of people think of it as just Baptist from the South, but Southern Baptist is a little more traditional, a uh, little stricter in, in some of their doctrine. My mother actually is, is a minister, 
and a retired principal and a minister and my dad coach. So I, I am the daughter of two educators and a preacher's kid. And, oh, no, uh, she, you're not the preacher's daughter, are you? I've heard so many stories about the preacher's I daughter. No, I know. And Is that you? True. <laughs> they are all true. Every single one of them. You know what? I wake up my first prayer every morning is thanking God that they did not have camera phones when I was, when I was younger. I would not be here today. You know, they say never talk about religion, sex, politics, or violence. But I want to ask you a religious question anyway. Um, is Do you, do you think um, organized religion, like, uh, like uh, my sisters are nuns, I, I see it. I see it shifting more with the uh, with the uh, generation next, and especially the millennials, more away from organized structural religion to more uh, spirituality. Do you do you see that trend, or is that just something I notice local? I, I see it like you uh, generationally. You know, I'm here in uh, the Dallas, Texas area in the Bible Belt, so uh, it just kind of depends on on which which church you attend and which what the denomination is. But overall, whether it be the wonderful Pope uh, that they have now, and they've all been great, but this one seems to be uh, quite a bit more progressive to uh, our political leaders. Uh, I'm seeing people just, in, you know, not be so judgmental and, and embracing the concept of love. With, with my circle of friends, when you talk about spirituality, they get a little bit upset because they want you to definitely say, uh, God and Christianity or, you know, whatever your denomination is, they feel like spiritu spirituality is, is a cop out. Uh, I don't necessarily feel that way, but uh, I do see things changing ever, ever so slowly, but surely. So you talk about um, the Wonder Woman, Superman syndrome and um, and that how you need to balance uh, family and work. What, what advice would you give these uh, kids? Uh, coming out of school thinking they're going to be a, uh, uh, one, of, one of the problems I, um, I don't understand is in 1900, one doctor did the whole body head to toe. And right. by a hundred years later, the MDs had 58 specialties and the dentist had nine. But now it seems like these kids are trying to go back in time where they want to come out of school and be that doctor of the 1900 at masters ortho and endo and perio and pedo and sleep apnea and all this things. And when they say they're going to go, like, add, like, uh, say, sleep apnea or Invisalign, I always ask, well, what are you going to take away? I mean, are, are, are we going to go back in time where you're going to master every single thing? in the? So, so it seems like historically it's gone to diversification and specializing. But now there's these, uh, these kids that want to come out, and they want to master everything. And do you think they can do that? And do you think that violates a work-life balance? Well, I can't say what one, I can't limit one individual to what they're capable of, but I can say the people that I see that are most successful in dentistry or any other profession are ones that limit themselves to one to two things. As you and I know, you can become a master of mediocrity. When you try to do too much and spread yourself too thin, you're always about 10 minutes late and 10 cents short. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, that doesn't benefit everybody. That doesn't benefit anybody, especially you, because it damages your res reputation. You don't get to be uh, considered an expert in something, which is really what we're trying to do. Be considered an expert in something so that not only are we knowledgeable, but we can share that knowledge. And when you're doing too many things, it's just I don't think uh, from a physiological standpoint that you can hold that much. So I would say to them, and you know, we all come out of school like that. I went in, into private practice as a, a associate with uh, one of my professors and her husband. And I tried, I did, I tried to do everything, uh, minor tooth movement, I tried to do endo, I tried to do perio surgery. And I soon figured out that not only was I not good at everything, but all money is not good money. So after a while, when somebody walks in with a bag of dentures and you know they're giving me telling me horrible stories about their last three dentists, you kind of figure out, you know what, it's going to be really hard to please this person. I might want to send them off to a prosthodontist. And this was before everybody was doing implants. But you learn to read people in situations and you learn your strengths. So I think we have to, I don't think that's something you can tell young dentists. Actually, I think it's something they have to learn that you cannot do everything. It's not going to be 
cost efficient. It's not going to be good for you or your staff to try every to try to do every single thing. But if they don't, they can't really figure out what it is that they like and what they're good at. So I would say, you know, hopefully they get through that stage quickly. We can keep telling them, but um, I, I really think it's one of those lessons you have to touch the fire to figure out that it's hot. And I would also say learn to delegate uh, and not just delegate the bad stuff that you don't want to do, but uh, use your time wisely. I think it was Mary Kay who said, don't use your dollar time doing penny work. There are even large corporations now that are outsourcing their PowerPoints, anything that they can uh, to other people so that their executives can spend their time doing strategic planning and actually things that are necessary for them to do hand on. Um. I want to uh, I, I want to ask you a question because only you're qualified to answer it. I'm not qualified to answer, but some women dentists, um, young kids, post on Dental Town that uh, I got out of school. I'm 25. I worked for Old Man McGregor for two years. Uh, I bought his practice, and now the staff treats me differently than the seller because <clears throat> he was a 55 year old man like Howard, and mm -hmm. they uh, and I'm I'm a girl, and it's different. And they say some say that girls treat girls different than they did the old uh, the old man uh, when he was running. Is, is that true or false? Uh, number one thing I would tell them is to get a new staff because <laughs> I, <laughs> you don't have to work work with those people and uh, I'm not gonna surround myself with people where we don't have a mutual respect. Um, you know it's just life is too short for that and it is really not that hard to find qualified people is hard to get them to work for you and to retain them but finding them is not particularly different particularly if you're rewarding them appropriately and my staff you know i'm in the dental benefits administration now but for the years that i was in practice of course i work predominantly with females that's what you know most of the staff is and i and i can't say that i i found that if anything I, I had some older uh, assistants a few times and they had worked with so many doctors and they probably did know more than me. So sometimes we would butt heads a little bit, but you have to be willing to learn from other people. I got to admit quite often they were right about whatever it is they were trying to tell me out in the hall or draw on the little paper in front of us where the patient couldn't see. So I would say spend that two years learning everything you can about the practice, not just getting faster, but learning about the business end, which is where we fail a lot. We don't know how to write narratives. We don't know how to submit insurance. We don't know how to do a lot of things on the business end and don't just sit in the break room drinking coffee and texting and, and checking on your Facebook, but be in there with those team members learning about the practice so that not only are you building your knowledge, but you're building a relationship with them. Quite often, that's the problem is that you don't have a relationship and you can't come in saying, you know, hey, I'm superior because I'm doctor, whatever your name is. And, you know, you should just suck up to me and, and hope that I keep you here. You got to build those relationships. You know, they'll bring the people back in. Folks love to come in and see the same hygienist that they've been seeing for years or the office manager who's friendly and answers the phone. But you got to build friendships. You know, it's fun. You, you, that was so profound because. I mean, I meet dentists all the time. They, they've worked for like two years in, uh, say, uh, um, Heartland or Aspen or, or Pacific, and I'll just say, okay, what, what's, what's the code? Uh, what, what, what's the code for a PFM? What, what's the code for a DO? They don't know any codes. Then I'll say, well, that office you worked at, uh, what was its monthly production? They say, I don't know. It's like, you worked two years in office. You didn't learn any insurance codes. You didn't. You don't know anything about production. What was the sundry? I mean. So the way I, I look at it is a lot of them say, well, I have to go to corporate. You know, I, got, I can't buy my own practice. I'm like, well, if Heartland has systems that run 1,500 offices, you, you tell me you, you can't pick up something there that you didn't learn in dental school? I mean, it's, it's an amazing opportunity to learn. Um, so yeah, so I, what, what, did, what dental insurance company are you working for these days? I'm with DentaQuest. Uh, oh, that's right. I knew that. Right. I'm with DentaQuest. We do uh, government, private programs, the Affordable Care Act, and I am one of their consultants. Uh, I was actually in management until the beginning of the year, but I wanted to, you know, one of the things I talk about in success is a side effect is figuring out what's important to you. And I was living in Austin and because managers have to go into the office every day and I wanted to be near my family. 
and my family's in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. So I made the decision to get out of management as well as the, the stress and the effects of that on my health. And it was not an easy decision. I'm a single woman, you know, near retirement age, and um, it's easy to get caught up in the, in the benefits, in the benefits on paper, in the benefits that someone can give you, but forget about the benefits that you can give yourself by changing your lifestyle and, you know, being able to <laughs> eat your lunch every day. It's an amazing company. Uh, they've been very flexible with me. I have to miss work for appointments. And sometimes I just don't feel well, Howard. Today is a good day, but sometimes, you know, I have side effects. So I got to give kudos to them. I, I got diagnosed one week after I started my job as dental director. It, I was there for training, got sick. And you can imagine, I thought, oh, my goodness, they're going to fire me. They're not going to keep me. I've been here one week. I'm supposed to hire and train a team in Texas in a new market. And they didn't blink. Uh, you know, I missed several weeks, came back. It was it was all good. So I'm, I'm grateful to them. But even there, I've, I've learned uh, Excel. I've learned more things about leadership and management. I take time out to talk to people in various positions, whether it's customer service. I've sat in with them. I, I don't have to take calls, but I want to know. That's people's first point of contact when they call the company. I want to know what they're saying, what they're doing what happens before they get to me. So back to making sure that you know what's going on inside of that business. And I've worked in big box briefly when I moved to Austin. There's some things that they won't give them access to, but that doesn't stop you from talking to people and certainly learning dental codes, you know, when the newest CDT comes out and taking classes that are in things maybe you don't necessarily like, but that will help you grow as a business person. Don't just keep taking the same CE and implants. You've got to diversify everywhere, particularly if you want to go into private practice one day or you want to have an operation in Empire like Dentaltown.com. You've got to know a lot more, <laughs> a lot more than how to do a, a MOD onlay very, very quickly. Well, that's neat because you're 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 really focused on your family life, whereas I decided at 53 that I'm not going to have any children, and my my four boys uh, aren't taking it very well. <laughs> He keeps saying. Uh, so, so if someone said to you, what, so, so, um, explain to these kids, uh, you know, they, they, when you come out of school, you know, they probably heard of Delta, Blue Cross and Blue Shield, you know, maybe, maybe Connecticut. So what, how, how what is Dentaquist's unique, uh, selling proposition? How are they different than say Delta Dental or Blue Cross Blue Shield or? You know what, um, uh, cosmetically we're not, uh, different, I would I would say that we all provide you know benefits administration either on the front end where we're doing everything for the company you know enrolling people and and doing the benefits administration and doing the peer to peer calls or on the back end where we're just doing administrative services for them, but we are in that same group of companies. DentaQuest has grown exponentially. We have uh, millions of members now. Uh, it was the merger of two companies, and, and I'm sorry, I can't remember all the history right now, but one in Boston and one in, in Milwaukee. But we are the number one administrative government program. So in Texas, where I am, for example, our largest client is uh, Health and Human Services, and we do Medicaid and CHIP for a couple of million kids here in the state of Texas, where we have a lot of uh, uninsured and underinsured uh, individuals who, you know, would be sorely impacted without the benefit of these government programs. Um, you, you mentioned the Affordable Care Act and, um, you know, you and I were baby boomers. And so when you looked at the snake of people, the, you know, it was like a snake swallowing a rabbit. The baby boomers were the big lump going through the middle and we kind of turned dentistry to uh, away from amalgams to tooth colored restorations, bleaching, bonding veneers. And now those baby boomers are retiring at 10,000 a day. That's why you see implants massively taken off. But I think there's right. not enough attention to the, to the snake's mouth of the fact that the millennials had an echo boom in 2007 of 4.7 million children. And then the Affordable Care Act comes along and says, health insurance has got to include dental for kids and then you're in a country, the United States, that only graduates one pediatric dentist for every million people. And I don't care how you look at this uh, demographics, pediatric dentistry is booming as big as implant dentistry. But all you hear about is 
implants, implants, and CBTCs, and surgical guides, and there's 175 different implant kits. And I keep saying, okay, that's all great and groovy, but if you look at the other end of that snake, there's a hell of a lot of kids coming in the pipe, and the Affordable Health Care Act, too, is, is good. I mean, it's a game changer for pediatric dentistry. Do you, do you think not? It is a game changer, and, and I don't think it'll be a uh, change with the new administration. I think they're going to keep it regardless of who's in office, and that I certainly don't want to get into. But Oh, uh, you're from back. Texas, so you're for Trump. They both start with T. Well, <laughs> so, that, no comment. <laughs> no comment. That's the other thing. These these young people have to learn how to come uh, coming out of school that telling the truth doesn't mean telling everything you know. Uh, but yeah, that's the important thing too about understanding your industry. When now that I'm on the corporate side of things, you know, it is very important to look at the people that we're competing with in our market and as as dentists particularly as young dentists, we often don't do that. We just go after the green, you know, and cosmetic dentistry in addition to implant dentistry is what everybody's talking about now. But there are so many other opportunities where you have a much greater chance of success, of excelling, of frankly paying back that six figure debt that you have than just going down the mainstream where everyone else is headed. So you just gave some interesting statistics that I didn't know. I mean, I knew the general trends, but they need to look at things like that when they're making very important life changing decisions. And the Affordable Care Act has put emphasis back on uh, children, uh, the CHIP programs, the Medicaid programs covering kids either up to 18 or up to 21. And if we don't get them then, in fact, uh, and I've worked at some at risk programs, on site at risk programs, if we don't get them really in elementary school and early middle school, their oral health journey is almost set for life. You know, those habits, those large feelings that will become crowns and root canals or implants. We've got to intervene a whole lot earlier and the pediatric dentists need to lead the charge because, you know, before I got out of practice, I really, I had gotten to the point where if I think it was eight or 10 years old. If they were under that age, I just, you know, as you get older, we talk about characteristics of dentists. I just couldn't, I couldn't do it anymore with the, with the hands moving and the, and the screaming and, you know, God bless them. And that takes a, a special person and we need more special people. If, if I had to be a pediatric dentist, I'd just turn in my license. Man, I, I would. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I don't say that to insult them. I'm so glad they're there, but I mean. I love molar endo. I love pulling wisdom teeth. I love mm -hmm. blood and guts. I love everything. But hand me a three-year-old kid, I'd go work at Taco Bell. I feel you. I fix, fix Pross was it for me. I love that. I love doing reconstructed things. I love veneers. But, you know, endo, molar endo, and perio surgery, those, those were the things well, that Mo, I can't. You, you've seen both for. sides. You, were, you owned your own office, and now you're in the insurance <laughs> side. What, what, um, what could you talk to those docs that are, uh, you know, what, what are common things they don't understand when they're submitting authorizations and claims? What, what, do you, what do you think a dentist drilling, filling, and billing doesn't understand on the other side of that form, uh, the dental insurance company? You know what, that is, that is a great question, and it is something when I was going out talking to providers that I would uh, talk about the most common mistakes that they make in submissions. Uh, number one is not being aware of what is being submitted, with, with, which goes back to the communication thing. Right now, I have peer-to-peers with doctors all the time, and, and quite frequently, there's either a non-diagnostic radiograph or a radiograph of the wrong tooth that's not pre-op, so they're sending me the post-op radiographs, so they're not familiar with the requirements, which are clearly listed. And there's so many plans, it's a little tough because it can vary between plans, but you need to know what your office is submitting. Uh, they submit template narratives. Well, you need to understand when we're going through and reviewing these authorizations, they tend to come through as a batch. So I see very easily that these 20 you submitted all say the same thing. So at that point, it becomes a little bit less uh, uh, convincing, shall we say, regarding the pain or the need for removal of these third molars when you're saying exactly the same thing about every child. So I would say narratives are really, really important. Diagnostic radiographs are really important. And being aware of the codes or any changes in 
code. You know, a lot of dogs want to submit miscellaneous codes just to keep from going to look up to see what the code might be for some procedure that they don't do frequently. But if there's a code, then you need to submit that code. Uh, you need to not change the codes to something that you think will approve. Um, that should not be done. We'll look at it. We'll let you know if it's, it's, if it's not appropriate or if it's going to be bundled. But you have to submit what you actually did. That can get you in trouble you know, with the board doing that. And it, I, I don't see a lot of egregious stuff. There's some bad guys out there. And, you know, we've had some issues in Texas, but they are a small percentage of the dentists. Most dentists are, are very ethical and trying to do the right thing, but just kind of caught up in the volume of work and not always employing uh, the best staff, uh, trying to get away with, with young staff, staff that they don't have to pay as much. And that is not the person that you put in charge of your insurance and your receivables. You, you need a, a tiger. You need somebody that's going to go after it and that really, really knows the business, someone that you're sending to classes and conferences. Um, I talked to a doc the other day, Howard, and just cut me off. I can go on at length, but he uh, it was an orthodontist, and I went through several authorizations, and it was the same panel and same set wow. sent with every wow. one of them. And check this out. It was a kid with a cleft. You know, number wow. 10 was missing, classic cleft. And so I was like, who would do this? This is such blatant fraud. This has to be an accident. So rather than turn them in for fraud, waste, and abuse investigation. I just picked up the phone and called. I'm like, hey, have you looked at your submissions? Do you see why we're denying these? And she, I told her what I saw, and she looked, and it turned out it was just a lazy staff member. She was tired of getting the records and submitting them. She didn't think we looked at them, so <laughs> she was just sending the same self and panel with every submission, not realizing she could cause the doctor to lose their license or uh, get in a lot of trouble doing that. So you got to know what's going on. Well, you know, the internet is, the, the lawyers, you know, I, at this point, the lawyers, I think, have uh, lost their uh, their case because it, it, it's gotten so excessive that, you know, when you go to a website to accept the terms and conditions, what right. percent of, of earthlings around the world are just hitting accept versus going in and reading them? And then right. if you did read them, I mean, it'd take you forever and you're still going to join Pinterest anyway, you know. So uh, so, so the question is, um, the, these average dental offices, you know, they probably take, what, what, do you th what do you think the average dental office takes in insurance plans? How many do you think? You know, I haven't a clue, Howard. I couldn't, I couldn't even venture to guess. Four, but four if, to 12? If, if you take them, yeah, if you t I would say more than that probably because if they either take them or they don't. So if they take them, they tend to take most of them. And if they don't, they don't. And how many of those contracts do you think the dentist read versus just click accept? Oh, you gave a perfect analogy of it. You no, just, none of you, them have read it. No. Yeah, and they, they don't know. The, but that's So that's the one thing Mo and I are telling you, you kids that you can't take all your classes on bonding agents and veneers and crowns. You, go, you own a business. And if you don't own the business, you're working in a business, it's to your advantage to learn the business. I'd rather you when you have a cancellation, go up there and learn how to submit an insurance claim, mm -hmm. then log on to Facebook and see somebody who just posted a final PA of a, you know, a molar root canal with six canals that is about a 98% chance has been photoshopped. Uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> no, because we, we, own, uh, we own a magazine and we, we tell them these pictures can't be photoshopped. And we're always getting pictures that our programmers mm -hmm. can throw up on a screen and say, well, yeah, look, look at all these deals. It's all it's all been, you know, it's all been, there's, so, so what you, what you see on Facebook, and it's the same thing with celebrities. I mean, you know, every, you might see a celebrity, you know, drunk, smoking a cigar or whatever, and it just might be their face on someone else's body. I mean, you have no idea what's on a photo, but I see these, uh, but learn the business. That's what most tell you. Mo, I want you to go, I mean, uh, so your middle name's uh, Frazier, right? Yeah, that is my maiden name. My middle name is actually Yolanda. I have a very long name, but uh, I was an only child and my dad was an only child. So that's my attempt to keep that name alive just a little bit longer. How many so, yeah. books do you have? Uh, I have six books, Howard. Um, I, I, wanna go, I, want, I want you to go through them because uh, maybe we'll help you sell some books. You, you're just so fun. I love you. Um, if you go to Amazon.com and, and type in uh, Monica F. 
Anderson, or Mon Monica F. Anderson, or Monica Fraser Anderson. Let, I, I want to name the book, and you, I want you to summarize it, so maybe these, uh, oh, by the way, let me tell you something about selling books. People like you and me, at our age, we buy books. So I put out a book, Uncomplicate Business, and it was selling mm -hmm. really well. But everybody kept telling me, millennials will never read a book. You got to do an audio book. So yeah, Ryan like sat me down on Skype and I read my book for, it took me five and a half hours and I put that online, boom. Mm -hmm. you, so, wow. so if you want to sell a book to anyone under 30, it's got to be an audio book. And, and, and your audio book will twice sell uh, your print book. And, and if you look at Amazon stats, they sell mm -hmm. more audio books than real books. Well, and they sell more ebooks too, which is uh, kind of nice because it's taking that, taking away that inventory. So that's my largest sale now is is uh, ebooks. But I heard you say that uh, to a guest. I was listening to your podcast, and I heard you say that, and it is very high on my to do list. So I appreciate that encouragement. I'll reach out to Ryan and find out how you guys went about that. But so I, I'm going to name the book, and you uh, you tell these uh, kids uh, your summary of it, and they'll decide where they go back and get the ebook. Mom, are we there yet? Mom, are we there yet? As you mentioned, and I have the books here. I'm holding up to show you the cover. Uh, it's I used to write for the Star Telegram, and when people hear that, I was a, a Sunday columnist for them, and that's a daily, large daily newspaper here in our area. They think that it was about dentistry, but you see, I have a variety of interests, and that was actually more like Irma Bombeck uh, type of book. And I talked about my kids were growing up at the time, and you know, we talked about going on uh, trips with kids because I feel like if you take your children with you, it is a trip, not a vacation because you, <laughs> you have to be worried about their safety and their social life and their diet. So that was a, a really good book, Everyday Family Life with a Big Dose of Humor. It's, it's still selling well. Now, that one uh, is available on Amazon, as you said, that probably uh, my second favorite book of the ones that I've written. All right. When a sister's fed up. When a sister's fed up is my uh, was my first novel. It was self published, and because I didn't bring this huge audience, you know, and I did, I wasn't on television. It was self published, and it became a, an essence bestseller. It is about the mayor of a small fictional Texas town, Mayor Faith Henry. And she is being torn lots of ways uh, with her kids, with her husband, with the community. And in this book, the other woman is the church. So my preacher's kid stuff kicks in a little bit. So it, it's an interesting spin on uh, being a powerful woman and having to deal with the consequences. <laughs> so is that you sitting in the chair? You know what? I wish it was me. Uh, <laughs> it's not I me. Would, I can say I, I can guarantee it's not me. me. You know, I've been using the same cover designer <laughs> in Atlanta for quite some time, and he has models that come in, and I don't like to use stock photos, so he brings in models, and and that's somebody's legs. I don't know, but I'll claim that, yeah, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Black English vernacular, the words politically correct Americans should know, from ain't to yo mama. From ain't to yo mama. That was my, uh, actually, my first book. And it is a uh, dictionary of Ebonics. And this came out right before the big thing in Oakland about Ebonics and kids being bi-dialectical. But I consider Ebonics an informal language. And at the time that I wrote this in the 90s, uh, it was controversial. But now every commercial, every movie, uh, everybody is using uh, Ebonics. And, I, and I'm not talking about hip hop language misogyny, but whether it's Aretha Franklin, I ain't never loved a man, know the way that I love you, the triple negative, uh, there are rules of pronunciation, there are rules of grammar, and it is an informal language. And, you know, you have to be able to use standard English, of course. That is the boardroom. That's, that's corporate language. But when you're with your friends and family, whether it's Yiddish or Tex-Mex, we all have a way of relaxing. <laughs> <laughs> You're so good with words from Yiddish to Tex-Mex. I don't think I ever would have imagined those two words <laughs> in the same sense. But, you know, texting has really been the end of English. I mean, when people are texting you, I mean, they're not going to spell check and be proper. No. And I mean, they I mean, they, they just I mean, don't you think texting is really downward pressures on the formal English language? 
texting is the end of eye contact. It is the end of social communication. It is the end of having an attention span. When my grandkids are, are with me, when my kids are with me, it is a no texting zone outside of an emergency. I think we're losing a lot of social skills and we are missing the moments. We are missing being right here right now with these people uh and i see there being some regrets to that even you know my boys before i enacted my martial law they would text yeah. each other across the room man you know probably making fun of me or something i had just said but and, and texting is a useful tool but i think it's overutilized and i think it's a way to avoid dealing with people which we have to do especially if you're a dentist you really want to hone those skills before you get that patient in the chair that that is you know she was fine with with the way the dentures were when you did the try-in but now she's back with their spouse and her daughter and they're ripping you a new one because you know she doesn't have picket fence teeth you need some communication skills extraordinarily so even more than you need to be able to fix that denture so my oldest boy is 27 he's married and uh, has my uh, only grandchild uh taylor who i think uh my granddaughter was my reward for not drowning all four of my boys there uh, you go. but the other the other three still live with me and, and i usually send a group text to them because if i yell uh, at least mm -hmm. two of them have headphones in, so I could, I could uh, shoot a 12 gauge shotgun, and I don't think anybody would hear it. Um, well, so mine are out. Mine are mine are out. So I, I send them a text in the morning. Hey, I'm still alive. Are you? Because boys are not <laughs> not as interested in calling every day. But, so what is uh, this yeah. other this other one? Is was it called Singpin or Symphony? Symphony. Oh, Symphony. Uh, Symphony, uh, Symphony. And oh, it is a Symphony. Oh, well, on, on Amazon, they, the, the picture, on my mobile, the picture's uh, cut off in half. Yes, it is. Uh, it, and this is about a school teacher. I bring in, you know, my background of my parents and, and good is. friends, a daughter-in-law being an educator. But she is involved with three men. Uh, I think you remember, and that means dating. I think you remember, uh, may remember Steve Harvey's book, Think Like a Man, and he says in there that, uh, you know, most people want the guy that's great, let's say at cooking, uh, to keep it PG, and they want the guy that is, uh, you know, really romantic and sweet, and then they want the guy that's handy, and those tend not to be the same guy. So it would take three guys to equal most women's idea of perfection. So this is about a lady just trying to raise her family, single woman, and deal with the issues of dating uh, in today's society. So it's a really fun read set in Austin, Texas. I uh, I do not date because uh, after my uh, divorce, I, I don't have enough money. I can't I can't I can't pay that kind of alimony again. I've decided uh, I'm good. I only talk about this one, which is uh, extremely important, especially if you if um, she just graduated and she's going to own a dental office. Success is a side effect. Success is a side effect. Leadership, relationships, and selective amnesia. And this one came about, I really enjoy writing um, fiction, but I've also written for dental journals. I just like writing. But this one kind of hit home. It was more personal because after being diagnosed and, you know, with a rare form of cancer for which there is no cure, I felt like you know, I was facing my mortality and there were some things I wanted to share, some lessons learned, not only personally, but I have friends in all phases of uh, industry, whether it be on an assembly line or the PTA mother. And there are just some things people don't tell you. We tend to want to brag about how successful we are and how accomplished we are and how great our kids are. But we don't always want to tell about some of the mistakes we made along the way to get there. Additionally, professionally, uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about, because it was a big switch for me going from being an independent person with my own practice to going to uh, corporate America. And there are some things I learned there that I wanted to share. Uh, for example, you know, we talked about delegate, but schedule your nervous breakdowns. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we schedule everything else, but we need to schedule time just to be introspective, maybe shed some tears over a glass of wine. It's coming, so you might as well put it on your schedule as opposed to letting it happen randomly. Uh, I talk about, and my, my target demographics is young women either entering the workforce or older women re-entering or folks just in between trying to figure out why they've hit that glass ceiling. Um, I talk about eat lunch with strangers. 
we have a tendency to surround ourselves with people who are like us. So if you're in a corporate environment or just with your neighbors, go out with someone who's maybe of another faith, of another culture, another gender, older than you, younger than you. That That's when we grow. That's when we learn, when we're not with people who always done what we do and think the way we think. And you realize how, how much bigger the world is than the little space that you occupy. And then my favorite is never close your heart unless it's temporarily under reconstruction. Um, (laughs) (laughs) You're so good. I love your creativity. Thank you. I've been through a divorce as well and and different relationships, whether it's with your children or with your parents. And there are times when you get very hurt. And uh, even with my diagnosis, I can say that initially I I was very depressed. I was I was bitter. I was angry with the world. Why would this happen to me at 49 years old with this great new job? Uh, Finally got my kids off to school and then to get hit with something like that. Uh, But you get you get to choose your attitude and. You know, once I got myself together and came out of the shock of it, I became an advocate for my health. Uh, I go out and I talk about GIST to different groups, uh, gastrointestinal stromal tumor, and and I empowered myself. There are things I can't control. I can't control that there's not a cure for it, but I can control how I live and my attitude and how I treat other people and the example I I set for other survivors. Um, And by closing your heart, there's so many ways to do that. There's not communicating, being emotionally withdrawn, there's throwing yourself into work to the exclusion of everything else, there's, there's drinking and the over-the-counter prescriptions. Uh, there, there are a lot of ways that we cut ourselves off and we're no longer available to other people. And, and it's really, really important that you be connected because I could not survive without my support network. I know that now more than ever. That, is, that, is, that was so profound. You should hit pause right now, rewind, one minute and then hit replay and uh and you you still have more books i stand accused i stand accused uh back to family this one is i have a male protagonist and those two handsome men on the cover are my boys it's, oh it's, uh, is that right yes i put them on the cover they are so, my my publishing company is Mag books and that's a combination of our names mo tony and ac they work with me, they do my social media, they help me with my IT. And when I went on tour for this particular book, we went to New York and Los Angeles and my usual tour stops, they went with me and it was a business trip. They learned a lot, they had no idea how hard it is to peddle books. And this was you know, Barnes and Noble and Borders before everybody crashed and they went out with me. But this is about an ophthalmologist. He grows up in, the, in a rural area, he's doing quite, quite well now but he's dealing with the ghost of lives past. He's the oldest of nine children and his father was killed. And he's at the age now where he's curious about his history and he decides to go back and find out, find out what really happened the day his daddy died. So we are, uh, I, I just want to know though, I, I, my feelings are crushed. You've written six books and you haven't written one article for Dentaltown. What up with that, Mo? You know what? Uh, you can't- <laughs> Ask not. I, I write for drbycuspid.com. I've written for Northwest Dentistry. And uh, you just let me know. I'm down. Whatever. Oh, anytime. Anytime. Any, anything that grabs you. Hey, we're. Congratulations. We're... Let, me, let me squeak this in. Congratulations to you on two years uh, with dentaltown.com. It is phenomenal. The growth. Uh, the variety of subjects on your podcast as I listen to them. And you, you, this is one of the best interviews I've ever had. So thank you and congratulations to you. Well, hey, uh, same back at you, Mo. I, I'm a big fan of yours. I love your energy. I love your karma. Um, you, you said what you're in dental school, you're the only African-American in dental school. At, in dental school. At that time. And you also <laughs> made history as the first African-American columnist for the uh, Arlington Star-Telegram. I did. That's that's who I originally wrote for as a guest columnist, and they were part of. They were a bureau of the Fort Worth Star Telegram, and in a short period of time, uh, they picked my column up, and it was so popular that it was uh, distributed to all of the bureaus. I became a writer for the Fort Worth Star Telegram, 
and uh, no journalism background. I've always loved writing, so it was just it was just kind of one of those fluke things. Started with me uh, being part of the junior league and writing for their magazine because I love to write. Uh, back to pursuing your passions. Nobody was paying me to do it initially, but I wanted to write, so I would take any opportunity anybody gave me, and it led to a paid position with a major daily. Wow. Uh, you know, like I say, you're never supposed to talk about religion, sex, violence, and politics, but uh, I feel so much uh, to the energy <laughs> and karma with you. Um, you and I were born in the 60s, and mm -hmm. now it's 2016. Um, not to be politically incorrect, but is race relations, uh, com compared to when we were little growing up, to 2016, better, worse, the same? What, what, what are your thoughts on that? Wow. Oh, or if, if you don't want to answer that, we we could just cut. I could I could edit that all out. I'm I'm, I'm open to Re discuss remember it's that. dentistry uncensored mode. So hit a hit a home hey, run right now. I, just knock it out I, of the ballpark. It's a good question. It's topical. Uh, how it I I thought that they were better, and I think they are over the civil rights movement days. Um, Martin Luther King, Jesse Jackson, the Voters, Voters' Rights Act. I think we've come a long way from that. But in other areas, in segmented areas, there's still a lot of improvement. And I don't know that we've made as much progress as I thought. Uh, I have always been, for example, respectful of the office of the president, even if I didn't necessarily vote for the person in office. And to see some of the things that I saw uh, during these eight years that President Obama have, was in office, they were not just disagreeing with his politics, but some of the horrible, horrible things said about him and his wife and his family, to see some of the things that I've seen on television recently. And I, and I can't speak to the police shootings. I know a lot of people want to go to that. Uh, that is a very complicated matter, but just in general and the things that I hear and see in minor actions with people, I should not at this point be worried about, you know, my adult sons to the degree that I am as young African American men uh, when they go out and about. And I, I am very, very worried about them. And I pray a lot for my young grandsons because we are not, everybody is not as, as open-minded and accepting as I would think, if you had asked me to guess uh, 16 years ago, say in 2000, where we would be now as a country, as much as I see uh, commercials with, say, an African-American female and a white male, I also see the stairs, and I still have people following me through stores and not touching my hand uh, when I go to get my change and just ridiculous things and you know some people would say you're imagining that but I have no re reason to imagine these things there's there's no way that I benefit from that and it it, it saddens me but I, I am hopeful I see change I see the racial amnesia of my young grandsons uh, in contrast to the racial constipation of my grandparents so I know we're getting there uh, but we are not there yet there's a lot to be done yet okay that flew over my head explain the difference between racial constipation and racial amnesia what what did how was it different for your grandparents and your sons so you're saying racial amnesia your sons forgot about the struggle from the 60s but your parents my, grand, my, my grandsons they don't uh, see color they just see their friends, as a lot of grandchildren do, you know, and they just love who they love. My grandparents talked a lot about, uh, and I won't say they're racist, but they talked a lot about racial issues and about, I mean, they, you know, grew up during the recession. They, they grew up during segregation. Uh, they saw Jim Crow. So their experience was very different and they had reason to uh, view the world through a different lens than my grandchildren do. So it's just either being stuck on that issue as opposed to being immune to it. And somewhere in the middle, I think is probably where we need to be because there's still issues that need to be addressed. Well said, and, it, and it's a problem around the world. I mean, Ryan and I in the last like four months of lecture in Fort Collins, we've been in Japan, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, and they they all have their, their racist deals. To, I mean. And, and to sit at a table, I mean, I remember one time I was in, a, in now it makes more sense, I was in the Ukraine. And, mm -hmm. and hearing, you know, you, you think of dentists, you know, they got eight years of college, these are the elites. And to hear the crazy things that come out of their mouth, 
Um, so, you know, it, it's, a, uh, it's, it's a problem, and I hope it goes away. But, Mo, I love you to death. Uh, I got a 100-page magazine goes out every month. Uh, you know, if you ever want to grace our magazine with something from you, it would be an I honor. Uh, thanks for all you do for dentistry. And you got to come, you got to come uh, speak at the townie meeting sometime. I would love that. I will follow up with you on all of these things. I thank you for this opportunity to uh, be a part of your great platform. I love what you're doing for dentistry. It's, it's amazing. All right. Well, I hope you have a rocking hot day.